It's a really, uh, really uh, unique last time. I've never really heard it before, but it sounds sounds pretty cool. Wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, welcome, welcome, brother CJ here. Uh, with me today is Rick and Ro uh, Roger. How are you guys doing? Doing well. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, today, uh, right now, we are going to talk about their uh, ministry, uh, Christian Motorcycle Association. Uh, Rick, um, you and I met uh, a couple weeks ago at the Men of Integrity Camp, mm -hmm. and we were talking about, uh, you know, the motorcycle ministry, and I, I, I found out quite interesting. Uh, just because you know, uh, not not really a lot of people know that um, there's a that that motorcycle ministry exists. Could you explain a little bit about uh, what it what it what you do in the motorcycle ministry, or um, you know how you um, came about it? Well, the Christian uh, Motorcyclist Association started back in 1975 mm -hmm. uh, by. Uh, a pastor named Herb Shreve mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a way that God has placed on our hearts we all you know love to ride motorcycles uh, we support all motorcyclists right. you know we respect all motorcyclists and uh, God made a way for us to go in and try to witness to them mm -hmm. and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them right so uh, do, do you think that um uh, what is tell us a little bit about the CMA like what do you guys uh, really really do what is your major focus well our major focus is just reaching the world one heart at a time that's mm -hmm. our model mm -hmm. and then we're here if they need us uh, you know when when you're younger and things are going well or and stuff it uh, it's easy to walk with the world but we're there to help pick up the pieces when mm -hmm. things fall apart. And we, we witness primarily, but not exclusively, to the motorcycling community. Right. Uh, rallies, secular rallies, runs, mm -hmm. events, uh, the Hollister run. Uh, there's, you know, we're a, a nationwide, worldwide organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, we minister to motorcyclist people. We, uh, you know, whether it's boots uh, handing out water, uh, up in Sturgis, uh, there's a big hospital ministry up there that CMA provides as far as uh, making sure family members are contacted. Uh, you know, bikes that have been acc in accidents get where they need to get, mm -hmm. you know, helping. And so we're just all about uh, reaching out to the motorcycle community. Roger, we haven't heard anything from you yet. No, no. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, I've been a member of CMA since 2000, so that's going on 17 years now. Uh, and I would just reinforce what Rick said. Um, God has called us to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ a lot of times to riders that aren't coming through the front doors of our churches. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they may have had a, a, a rough experience in, with people, but they haven't had a rough experience with the person of Jesus Christ. So mm -hmm. um, that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to bring the good news um, that they might have life and have it the way that Jesus wanted them to have it, have it abundantly. You know, so uh, we gain their ear uh, by helping them. You know, um, a lot of times, whether it's picking up trash, whether it's helping a guy with his bike, uh, you enter into a relationship uh, humbly uh, with a servant's heart and after you earn their respect or a chance to speak to them then we can offer the gospel we can offer testimony so we just let the Holy Spirit lead and and do what he tells us to do yeah what about your testimony tell us a like a little bit about you know how you came to Christ and oh um, wow uh, <laughs> well um, I've been riding 
motorcycles, gosh, a little over 40 years now. Um, didn't always follow the Lord, you know. Um, at a point after I was married, I was saved, and, uh, and I fell in love with the person of Jesus Christ. And I had had a, a medical issue to where I didn't know if I was going to be able to ride again. And I prayed and I asked the Lord, I said, if you allow me to ride, I'll ride for you. And I met some guys um, that were in CMA and talked to them at a secular rally. I think it was in, in Clovis. And it impressed me how they weren't judging. They weren't selling doctrine from this place or that place. Um, they were very simply and very honestly and unashamedly presenting the love of Christ. And I responded to that. You know, that's what I responded to when I got saved was how much he loved me. I never knew he loved me like that. And uh, so I saw it as a answer to prayer and jumped in with both feet and never looked back. Mm. Praise God. Praise God. You know, uh, there, there, there comes a, a, a point to where, I, you know, when you were, uh, we were talking about, um, you know, going to a secular rally. Um, for our new believers out there and our new um, uh, our new viewers, um, could you explain what a secular rally is? Most people, when they go to a motorcycle event, and it doesn't even have to be a motorcycle event, it could be a concert or a party or um, even a park on a Saturday, um, they're looking to satiate the flesh, to satisfy the flesh. They're looking for shiny objects to look at, whether it's bikes or cars. Um, sometimes they're, they're looking to, to, for some enjoyment of some kind um, that has to do with the world. You know, um, that's what I mean by secular. It's not, they don't, when he, Rick mentioned Sturgis. Sturgis is the largest rally in the country. They have over 500,000 people go there once mm -hmm. a year. When people go to Sturgis, they're not going to Sturgis for a, for a encounter with the Lord Jesus right. Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, but as he mentioned, the hospital ministry, after someone has a near-death experience and crashes and survives and they're in the hospital, now they're thinking of their mortality and more importantly, maybe even their eternity. They're open ears and, and ready to listen at that point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the service things we do in, in Sturgis, we supply the, the benches that people sit on. You can't sit on a block in downtown Sturgis, South Dakota unless it has CMA on it because we supply those. Mm -hmm. um, we help at the museums and just try to be a help to help the rally go um, a little bit smoother, kind of working behind the scenes. and. That doesn't go unnoticed by people. They see that. But I think most of it is, is just what, what Rick was talking about. Personal testimony, um, personal demeanor, mm -hmm. um, and personal witness. You know, don't talk it so much as live it in their presence. Right. You know. Well, um, you know, uh, I, I spoke about this before on, on the show, but um, I'm going to say it one more time. Is uh, um, Last year I watched a uh, Facebook video. Uh, by evangelist uh, um, named by uh, Todd White and Todd White was uh, doing a video on him going out in the streets and you know just loving on people and he was saying you know ministry ministry all it is really is about loving on people because it shows what Christ does uh, in our lives and it shows who Christ really is through us and that's the important part uh, when we um, you know, reach out to people, do outreaches and stuff like this. And Rick, I believe you got um, you got some um, uh, papers you wanna you wanna explain a little bit about. Sure. Um, the Run for the Sun uh, is our only fundraiser that we that we hold. You know, once mm -hmm. a year, it's the first Saturday in May. Right. And um, we do that to raise money uh, for you know three main. It's uh, there's 40 percent that stays with uh, CMA mm -hmm. missions uh, that provide the tracks, the rag track, like I showed you, right. different things like this, and then uh, 20 percent of that would go to what's called the uh, missionary ventures. Right. Well, they actually purchase transportation 
mostly motorcycles mm-hmm. that can get the pastor around from village to village or wherever. Right. But there's been, you know, uh, donkeys, camel, right. you know, and so that's 20% goes to that. Another 20% goes to uh, the Jesus Film Project, right. where they actually are able, with the technology nowadays, in a backpack that has the projector, the power source, the little screen and everything, and they go into these villages and they show the Jesus film uh, in their own language. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's been hundreds of thousands of people that have been led to the Lord well, through that. I, I know we discussed this before, but um, our viewers aren't aware of this, but what, what uh, can you specify on, on Jesus films? like? Is there is there more than one film? Is there just one film? It's just one film. There's different uh, versions mm-hmm. of you know the gospel, Jesus, or right. what have you. But this is just the one uh, Jesus film, Roger. You know when it started, came out back in the '70s, probably or. You know, I I don't know exactly when it started. Um, what I do know about the Jesus film is they say for every dollar uh, invested in the film, there has been at least one salvation. So it's, it's a worthwhile investment. A lot of times, um, especially in a society now that where you have more visual learners than anything else, um, people really identify um, with the Jesus film when they see it in their own language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and it basically depicts the gospel message. Right. You know, exactly what happened at Calvary and why, and you know, what God did and as a gesture of love for us and people are floored by it as we all were. Yeah, yeah. You, you were saying that society mm-hmm. is uh, is more visual today. You know, I can totally agree with that too. You know, that's one reason why I feel that you know the Lord has start uh, started up fire starters. Um, actually, um, you guys probably haven't heard uh, the testimony how I started. I probably explained it a little bit to you, but um, to those who haven't heard this, is uh, two years ago. Uh, I was on an addiction run. I was, uh, I, I had my addictions to the internet, such as you know pornography, or just literally I couldn't get off of the internet. And um, you know, the, uh, I finally read. You know, it, I was born. I gave given my life two years prior um, to two years ago, which is like uh, back in 2012. I gave my life, and then in 2000. Uh, 15 is when I rededicated my life to Christ and when I did that that was the last time I looked at any pornography or anything like that and a few weeks later the Lord says start an internet ministry I hesitated because first off you know uh, the enemy could try to trick you and try to deceive you and try to get you back to your addictions I didn't want that so I hesitated I you know prayed on it and I'm like Lord is this you is this you and then um, later on, so many co- confirmations have have came upon me to where you know, yes, this is this is him. You need to start it now. And um, so I started it uh, May seventeenth of twenty fifteen, and that's what that's the that's the day um, that I started learning all this visual stuff. When um, uh, I started learning, you know, a lot more people are more prone to visuals than you know reading. Uh, uh, reading some articles or reading some stuff, but you know, um, we have a we have a website, we have a YouTube, but both are in balance with each other because there are some people that you know still read, still like to read, and there are some people that you know like to uh, watch videos instead. And um, yeah, I just want to say you know I totally agree with that. And um, you said uh, there was an event coming up as well. Uh, Rick, and would you like to explain a little bit more about the one uh, here in Madero you're talking uh, about? The uh, the 100 mile ride that you were oh, talking about. Oh, the Run for the Sun, that's yeah. this Saturday, mm-hmm. where uh, each chapter uh, picks a, de- a destination. Um, they'd like it to be uh, at least 100 miles right. for the run. And this Saturday, we're riding up to. Uh, Squaw Valley area. Mm-hmm. There's a, a car show up there. Uh, Pastor Joe Maxwell, who used to be one of our evangelists, uh, the CMA is divided up into regions, mm-hmm. and uh, so many states uh, constitute a region, 
and there's a national evangelist that is ahead of that and then there mm -hmm. are uh, state coordinators mm -hmm. you know then for chapters there's uh, uh, Dan Brazier is our area rep yeah. you know so but anyway we're going to be riding up this weekend uh, to Joe Maxwell's uh, church up there there's a car show going on and uh, you know, we ride up there at 10 o'clock, our time, Pacific Standard. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do a prayer, which is a uh, nationwide prayer uh, for, you know, for Run for the Sun. Do you guys have a goal uh, of the fundraiser? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Our goal is to raise $5 million. <whistles> uh, last year, we raised uh, <laughs> 4, 4, 491000 and some odd, you know. And that's just, you, you know, at, w at one day, you know. Uh, we don't charge for any of our services. When we do our bike blessings, uh, it's free. When we provide coffee, water, whatever it is, it's free. There are chapters in Arizona in the uh, middle of March, every year we go in, down to Parker on the Colorado River and we just have fellowship there, uh, CMA chapters, anybody's welcome. And uh, there's some chapters out of Phoenix, Arizona, and Yuma, Arizona. And some of them, they set up their pop-ups. Right. This one chapter has six pop-ups. Mm -hmm. And they serve a full breakfast. And that's their ministry. The Lord has provided them, and they pay for that, right. a full breakfast. So when they go to these uh, secular rallies, you know, the guys come around, they're hungry. They've been up partying or what have you yeah. all night long or mm -hmm. what have you. And then, mm -hmm. and then here there's breakfast, you know, with a smile, with a hot cup of coffee and some scrambled eggs or, or bacon or what have you, you know. And I, I understand that this isn't just in the United States. This is world. This is an international. It's international. Ministry. In 37 countries. Yeah. But those are the three uh, missionary uh systems that we support mm -hmm. and uh, when we go into these uh, secular rallies and stuff you know we stay prayed up right. you know uh, I joined uh, CMA uh, back in 2009 uh, because uh, I just wanted to have some you know people to ride with mm -hmm. that you know that aren't bar hoppers right you know and talk about motorcycles and hang out for the fellowship but as i got into it more and more and more the lord started leading me into the ministry aspect of it mm -hmm. not everybody joined cma to you know minister to lost bikers right a lot of people start out just because hey it's a group it's a safe it's kind of a ride. safe group mm -hmm. to ride with we take care of each other uh, when we do our rides and whatnot mm -hmm. so uh but eventually you know the lord leads that direction into the ministry right is there anything uh in, throughout all your years of being part of the cma for both of you is there anything significant that has stood up in your life that's really you know hit you and still stuck with you today wow. yeah for me there's two occasions uh, one of the ministries that we do is we, we partner with uh, Bill Glass and we go into the prisons uh -huh. and we minister the gospel uh, to the inmates. The first time I had gone to a prison, I went into Folsom, old Folsom prison, and there were some guys in there, I, I don't know how old they were, um, probably early 20s, if not teens. And they had, they were standing there trying to look hard, but they had a shock look on their face like reality check, it all just, became too real mm -hmm. and uh, there, I went there with another lady a 61 year old lady and I was surprised at how lion-hearted she was but we talked to four young men and actually got to witness two of the men there uh, amongst all their peers a yard full of inmates um, except Christ and you can see the Holy Spirit fall on them and one of the guys looked like he was freer than anybody on the outside of the prison mm -hmm. and he was looking at a life sentence yeah. and for me that was ground shaking um, you know to see it you know you hear about it all the time 
but to see it happen was uh, was ground shaking for me. Um, you know that that was just one of the things I was I was glad to see or shocked to see how how powerfully God moved in that environment. You know, um, other thing is is sometimes we we'll, we've gone into bars just to have a Diet Coke, you know, just to go in and, and show respect, but not participate, be in the world, but not of the world. Mm -hmm. And one time, uh, one of the guys in our chapter and I, we went into a bar there um, in the South Valley, and the band actually stopped praying, and they invited us up to the stage to pray, and there was some rider down or some situation, but there's a thirst, there's a hunger for the, for the touch of the Lord. There's a there's a hole in there that, that, that people know about. And they, they, they're trying to stuff other things in there to get satisfied. Only Jesus, a relationship with Jesus can satisfy them. Mm -hmm. But there's a yearning, there's a thirst. Right. And God knows, he knows Ooh. right where to put you, <laughs> you know, to offer yeah. that thing that can fill that hole. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's amazing to me still every yeah. day. It's mm -hmm. amazing that you say that because um, uh, my pastor says it like this, you know, each each and every person, no matter who you are, has has a hole. Nothing else could feel but God. Mm. That's so powerful right there. That was a really strong confirmation. I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we also, uh, I think what sticks with me is uh, I had been a member of CMA for about uh, just over a year, but I really didn't belong to any local chapter. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I met Roger actually at uh, Renegade Motorcycle uh, Clothing Place here in uh, Fresno area, Clovis area, and uh, he gave me a card and put it in you know in my my wallet and and I lived in Madera at the time, and uh, little did I know how the Lord orchestrates our lives and guides us without us even being aware of it. Uh, about a year later, I ended up uh, taking another job near Lamar. Mm -hmm got over there was going through some stuff and saw that card called roger and uh they were just happened to be going on a chapter ride we, once a month we have our monthly chapter rides mm -hmm. where we ride different places it's not all about ministry that's the main focus but we do like to get out and ride and uh what really struck me uh when i got to the uh, restaurant there in hanford where we were meeting two of the members uh, pulled up just before my wife and I did and uh, ran up and shook our hands and and gave us big just made us feel so welcome you know and then on that ride I had been riding again for quite some time and normally it's every man for himself yeah you know uh, on the highway and I noticed how CMA took care of the group where that where that's the road captain the sweep how they ride, how they change lanes, so and everything. So it was like a it formation. Yeah. Oh, that's, it was that's very impressive. Cool. <laughs> and I have since invited other friends of mine to ride with us on our ride days. And the same thing, you know, the, the same notice. Hey, man, you guys, I like the way you ride. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I wanted to mention, too, if I may, uh, uh, we talked about a little bit about the bear ride. Right. And... Uh, that touched my heart too because uh, uh, Bill Moss, who was uh, an area rep uh, before, mm -hmm. now uh, retired out, but uh, he was up at Ducey's at Bass Lake one Christmas season several years ago, and he says sitting in a hot tub and just had this uh, idea of kids and this bear and how they would dress up this teddy bear mm -hmm. to look like a biker, right, and. Uh, children that are, have uh, terminal diseases or, or illnesses or battling cancer and things uh, we would ride to their wherever it is that we ride to whether their home or a, a, a destination anyhow right. and give them this little teddy bear pray for them let them pick out any motorcycle they want to go for a ride on and ride on it and then uh, take a donation for the family and just lift them up and a lot of times, the kids are excited to get the little bear, but it touches the, the parents, uh, touches their heart that, that here these guys would, would 
would have enough love to want to share uh, with perfect strangers. We do that quite a bit, even with uh, different chapters. We just uh, s uh, helped uh, with a uh, secular bike club, uh, Traffic Kings out of Hanford, uh, and what they call their Easter egg extravaganza at the park, where uh, we donated uh, time and supplies. And, you know, that that's part of, you know, Jesus, when he was on this earth doing his ministry, he not only met the spiritual needs, but he met the physical needs. Right. And a lot of time, that's a good end is the physical needs. Mm -hmm. And we build relationships. Like I said, we, uh, we respect all motorcyclists. And uh, we're here to serve the best way we can. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's one thing that really touched me was the the kids and uh, we're always looking for opportunities uh, for bear rides and uh, now CMA actually has their own bear you mm -hmm. know that uh, that we can purchase and, and, and pass out instead of before it was buy the bear and dress him up and right. you know make him look like a biker that type of a thing you know? <laughs> yeah but you know it, it, it's it, it, it ceases to amaze me that you know, just about wherever we go people are surprised to see that there are Christian bikers yeah you know, uh, and we ride for the Lord. I yeah. first I first heard of the uh, Christian uh, bikers when I uh, uh, what was it? it was about a couple, two or three years ago, and I was like, shouldn't bikers just be in gangs or something? Uh, but then th th this was when I, you know I was still a baby Christian, you know, mm -hmm. still you know learning about the ways of the Lord and all that, and that's one of the things that people get confused of, you know. The Lord uses many things uh, uh, as tools. You know, sometimes it, the, uh, the the devil uses uh, brings something uh, and uses something to to try to uh, attack. You know, attack the body of Christ. Sure. But the Lord can turn that around to use that to evangelize, to love on people. And that's what I love, especially the internet, you know? This is what, you know, what, mm -hmm. what Firestarters are doing and what what uh, CMA is doing is just pretty, pretty awesome, pretty unique. So, yeah. <laughs>
And so how that was accomplished was only by his will and his way, because there was there's no forcing things when it comes to institutional life and those that are in charge over you. If they tell you you can't do something, well, if you want to stay there, then you have to obey what they tell you, because if you just do your own thing, they're going to ask you to leave. And I never wanted to see you for Christ suffer over how zealous I was to do what I wanted to do. But God works all things out. He teaches, He shows, He opens doors that men can't open, and He closes doors that you can't force back open. And so um, it was a real blessing to go back there today. They invited me to do the invocation, as I mentioned, and uh, to reconnect with people that I've known and worked with in in the past mm -hmm. and uh and we'll see what god does in the future here yeah praise god you know um uh, rick was talking about uh um earlier today about um you were doing outreaches to uh giving uh teddy bears to, to mm -hmm. the kids and and um yeah and um you know uh if if you haven't heard the uh, testimony uh between uh, the story between me and ron is Ron was the chaplain at the juvenile hall, and I was the inmate. <laughs> and um, and I, you know, his music affected my life. And um, I guess it, it the uh, the music that flew through him from through the Holy Spirit was just it just really uh, I took a grasp on it and still today, and it's really affected me and it really reached me and re touched my heart to where I wanted to change. It's it helped me. Um, grow in the juvenile hall as a person you know to to change for myself um, of course that was you know before I really really dedicated my life to Christ you know um, uh, I'm sure a lot of us and that's been behind bars we've been guilty to you know just fake our um, our surrender to, to the Lord and whatsoever they just want to do it just to you know just to, just for entertainment whatsoever now that was my purpose but Knowing the Holy Spirit now is that had reached me, even though I didn't completely receive it. It still surrounded me until I was ready to grasp on it, and it was right there for me to reach out. I need this. Give it to me. So years later, you know, Ron, Ron and I met together, and um, you guys know the rest. You know, we started our fire starters, and that's how that came along. And um, yeah, good. Yeah. Who would have known back then yeah. what it was going to be today? I I, don't, I probably would have never even thought of that. Yeah, yeah. And especially you know, especially since back then I didn't know anything about this uh, live stream stuff. I didn't. Know, I, the Lord had to show me step by step, yeah. little by little. He's good at that. Yeah, it was it was <laughs> it was a learning process. <laughs> I, I admit, you know, at the beginning it was really really frustrating. But now when I get to a difficult task, I know. That Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And through Him, He shows me the ways, the steps to do it. No matter how long it takes me to do it, I know I can do it. Because with Christ, all things are possible. Yeah, yeah amen. Amen. amen, amen. And just uh, like meeting Rick at the Men of Integrity recently, and now Roger today, praise God. <laughs> I mean, you know, things is God puts things into order. And uh, we know that things happen for a reason and for a purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we always get to be the recipients of all that blessing. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Rick, uh, uh, last, uh, well, we heard Roger's testimony on uh, on how he uh, um, surrendered his life to, to Christ and how he found him. And um, But we haven't really quite heard yours. Would you be able to... Um, Tell us a little bit about your backstory. Sure. Um, you know, I grew up in, in the valley here out on the west side. Uh, my uh, birth father I never knew. He, uh, he and my mom divorced when I was three, and we lived out in Mendota in the, in the projects. Uh, grew up very poor. Uh, had it not been for my grandparents, we'd have probably starved to death on mm. more than one occasion, you know. But uh, my mom uh, remarried in 65 and uh, to a gentleman, you know, my stepdad, who I never consider him now as a stepfather. He was the only father I knew. But uh, he was strict with us. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really know his story, you know. Uh, he was a great provider. I uh, loved my mom, but he was hard on his kids. Uh, 
strict wise. But uh, my grandparents lived in Fireball. We lived out Mendota. And uh, to go to the movie theater, we had to go to Fireball. Because Mendota didn't have a English speaking movie theater. It was Spanish only. So uh, my parents were not Christians. My grandmother was a strong Christian woman. And my parents uh, made it clear that if we went over there to stay with them, she had to let us go to the movies. And so that would be one. But if we went on Friday to go to the movies, either Friday or Saturday, Sunday, we were going to church. So you had to take your church clothes to go to church. So I grew up, you know, knowing about God and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, to me, God was just somebody that was out there just waiting to kick you down, you know, in the back or something or uh, because, you know, at that time it was very controlling as far as, you know, uh, very legalistic, the denomination that she was in. Uh, I remember her telling me constantly, you know, Jesus is not going to go in that movie theater with you. And I heard that from the time I was in elementary school till when I graduated high school, I was starting to dabble a little bit into drugs back in the uh, early 70s, 72, I graduated at Tranquility High. And uh, I had finally had enough of it. I was going to go into, uh, get ready, I joined the Navy, and I went one more weekend, say good my goodbyes, and of course I was going to go to, to the show. And once again, she tells me, uh, Rick, you know, Jesus ain't going to go with you into that movie. And I said, that's okay, I'll pick him up on the way out. And that was my mentality of God. You know, if you were wanted God in your life, you couldn't basically have any fun. And uh, got into the service, got into some issues, uh, went to Viet spend a year in Vietnam, mm. uh, started partying pretty hardy, drinking quite a bit. Uh, came back for some leave. I was going to go to what they call an A school in San Diego, and I got busted with an ounce of marijuana on base. And to make a long story short, I got, uh, they gave me a general discharge under honorable conditions, but at that time a lot of guys were coming back strung out on heroin mm -hmm. and dope, and they were trying to sweep everything under the carpet, so uh, I got out. And back then, they, they they weren't supporting the troops like they do. Praise God, they do now. Yes, thank you. You know, yeah, you guys had it tough. Man. And uh, oh yeah, I was called all the names, spit on, and all that. Well, anyway, I got back to Fireball. You know, uh, my folks still lived out there near Spreckle Sugar Factory in Mendota, and I uh, just started partying. You know, and I was real. You know, one thing led to another. One thing led to another, and it would. Uh, it took over my life. Uh, I got addicted to drugs. I had a, a friend of mine, uh, an old roommate, came around one day, because back then uh, the melons were real big in Fireball Mendota, summertime, the cantaloupes, and it was all union work, so the uh, we made good money working in the cantaloupes. And uh, the little towns would be two, three thousand people would swell up to nine, ten thousand people. And everybody's making money, so you can make money selling drugs. Yeah. You know. Anyway, he came by the house one day, and I was I was smoking pot and drinking beer, and you know, using a little bit of that, this and that. And he had a an eight ball of uh, cocaine, uh, which is three grams of of coke. And he said, "Hey, you think you could sell this for me?" I'm like, "Man, I don't know anything about that. You know, I like to use it, but you know." He said, just take it and try it, you know, try to sell it. So I went down to the shed, 15 minutes, I sold all seven grams, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, that just started, you know, took it back to Fresno, gave him his money, he gave me more, you know, just kept back and forth. Then I started using, liked it, you know, started fixing a little bit, you know, liked that even better. Mm -hmm. uh, got to where I was using more than I was selling. And since everything was out on the front, I didn't pay anything to get it. You know, got it on credit, basically. I was always trying to make up 
the next batch you know what i mean I, i'll make it up on the next batch i'll make it up on the next batch well right. the, that never happened and uh my grandmother <laughs> god bless her soul she she kept praying for us you know i can remember when i was in high school being there at her house and she'd get up in the wee hours of the morning and just start oh god save rick oh god just over and over loud enough where i could hear it yeah and i'd put the pillow over my head i did not <laughs> want to hear that and i'll never forget one morning i went in to have breakfast with me and my grandpa you know we, we were tight my grandpa and i were real close and he looked at me he said uh I wish you'd hurry up and get saved so I could get a good night's rest. <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, that, that was kind of comical. But but uh, as time went on, uh, I got so involved in cocaine. And, and the only reason why I didn't do heroin uh, was because I did not like to throw up, you know. And a good shot of heroin, you were going to puke. And uh, so I stayed away from that pretty much. But I got to where, you know, fixing cocaine, man, your heart started beating. And there was a few times that yeah, I thought I was gonna overdose. And the one thing I knew about God was if I died in that state, I had a one-way ticket to hell, hey. you know? Hey. And I did not want that, you know? So I would call her, mama, we called her mama. Mama, will you pray for me? Oh yes, honey. So she would pray, I'd feel better, Next day, I was out slamming again, you yeah. know? And that went on for the better part of 10 years. Wow. And then I had a friend of mine uh, came by one day, said, hey, uh, how would you like a kilo of cocaine? Not just an eight ball, but a kilo. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. I hit the <laughs> jackpot, you know? And because I was so bad off that if somebody had came to me and told me that I could go on a all expenses paid trip around the world, but I couldn't take any drugs, I wouldn't have gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, that, that's how Satan had his hooks on me. And, uh, you know, there would be 20, 30 pounds of marijuana up my rafters. Uh, there would, you know, I would be so strung out that I couldn't remember where I put the money. I couldn't remember this and that and the other thing. I was sneaking out. I didn't want to use the the phone. And half the time I didn't have a phone. I'd go down to make a, use a pay phone. And my wife thought I was out, you know, calling another gal or what have you. But anyway, just a mess. Bottom line, there was no peace in my mm. life. Amen. But when that guy offered me the chance to get that kilo, I thought this is going to solve all my yes, problems. Yes, yes. You know, I'm going to be able to pay everybody that mm. I owe, and there was quite a bit, and I'm going to have plenty left over. So we take off, <laughs> and we go down to Mexico, you know. And they had given me a 1979 Monte Carlo had Mexican plates, but but I had the pink slip, signed the pink slip over to me for collateral, right? A lot of good that did. But anyway, <laughs> go down there, and I'm, you know, here I am in the hotel at Rosarita Beach, uh, stuffing rolled up cows on the bottom of the door and smoking pot with the federales right outside the hotel. Wow. You know? And the guy, the guy that was there with me, was like, "Man, you're crazy!" Mm -hmm. But that's how strung out I was. Yeah, I could not yeah. go hardly an hour without putting something in my body. Mm -hmm. You know, going walking out on the beach, you know, and smoking and and this and that. Well, anyway, I was taking pills too, uh, whatever I could get my hands on. Yeah. And at the time, yeah. it was uh, some Valium. Mm -hmm. I had the you know the strong number tens or whatever the blue ones, mm -hmm. Valium. And I had a pocket full of those, you know, that was just like M&M's, that was just, you know, some extra. But uh, the people that were bringing the coke up had a restaurant in Mexico City. And they uh, were going, they would go to Ensenada to get fish to take back, you know, a big load at a time. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't have the right permits for some shrimp that they were hauling. And they searched and they found the coke. Mm. 
So the driver snitched us off, which was one of his relatives. So they finally got in touch with him because I'm like, hey, what's going on? Where's all, where, where are the drugs? You know what I mean? And uh, he says, hey, we got to get out of here. You know, and I'm like, like, why? Do we got, do we got it? Do we got it? You know? Hey, let's just go. Let's just go. So we jump in this little Datsun B210, and we take off, and all of a sudden the federal rallies are chasing us in a jeep. They're behind mm -hmm. us in a jeep, and we've got about 13 miles to get to the border. Mm -hmm. And uh, my buddy tells my other friend that were down there with us, "Don't stop. Just get to the border. Do not stop." You know, and he's telling me, hey, whatever you got, get it out the window. So I'm searching, picking up seeds and roaches and tossing <laughs> them out, you know what I mean? House cleaning up. Yeah, it's, it's just like the movie, you know what I mean? The guy comes and there's a there's this truck hauling chickens, you know, and we were almost run him off the road because we're, you know, we're trying to get to the border. And then I remembered I had a pocket full of Valium. Ooh. And I was not going to throw those out the window. I hear you. So I just ate all of them you know so by the time we get to the border I'm feeling pretty good oh yeah mm -hmm. we get to the border <laughs> we pull in they come running out federal rallies are right on our tail and the guy says uh hey smugglers drug smugglers this was about 82 something like that and uh we're not smuggling nothing you know we've just been down partying you know Rosarita Beach so they pull the car in and they search it, they don't find nothing. So, you know, we're US citizens. And so the uh, Border Patrol tells them, tells us, just get out of here and don't come back. So basically, you know, we're going through San Diego, LA, and I'm like, man, dude, what, what happened to the dope? You know, we're, you know, how are we gonna get it? And uh, knowing that I am really over my head at this point in time. And so, uh, get back to Mendota. I'm wondering, you know, what am I going to do? What am, how am I going to get out of this one, you know? And uh, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there watching TV, you know, and uh, smoking a joint, and my palms started sweating, you know? So I uh, <laughs> went into the bathroom, washed my hands, came back out. My heart starts beating fast, you know? It's beating like crazy, and... and uh, I told my wife, I said, you know what, I think you better take me to the doctor's office, you know, I ain't, I ain't feeling that great, you know. Not knowing then that I was having a nervous breakdown. Mm. So she takes me to the doctor's office here in town, and the doctor uh, took most of his lunches at the local bar, and he was on a two-hour lunch. Mm -hmm. And here I'm sitting there, you know, thinking I'm dying. <laughs> and. Uh, and the nurse says, "Well, hey, let me call a uh, let me call a taxi. Uh, let me call uh, the ambulance. Take you to Fresno." I said, "No, I ain't gonna make it. I ain't gonna make." I was convinced that I was not gonna make it yeah. from Mendota to Fresno yeah. in an ambulance. I needed somebody right now. And I looked at my my first wife, and uh, I said, uh, "Will you pray for me?" And she started laughing, <laughs> and she said, "I can't pray for you. You know, you know." And so I closed my eyes, and I did not. It was not like a jailhouse prayer or anything. And it, and I didn't want another chance. Mm -hmm. But I did not want to go to hell, which I knew if I died, I said, God, I'm not asking for another chance because I don't deserve it. But would you come into my heart? You know, thief on the cross. You know what I mean? Yeah. Remember yeah. me. Yeah. In your kingdom. Yeah. And so the doctor came in not long and said, ain't nothing wrong with you. You had a nervous breakdown. Here, gave me a script for uh, <laughs> for some uh, more value. Yeah, that's what you, know? you needed. Uh. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> right on, you know. So I go home, and uh bottle says, take one. That one ain't going to do me nothing. That's right. i got to take four or five just to get normal again. Still smoking pot. And my grandmother, you know, she had gave me this... Uh, she had gave me this little tape recorder, uh, one of those old ones, with a testimony from this girl that used to play Kathy on Father's Knows Best program back in the 60s and stuff. And her testimony, how she came to Christ through uh, heroin addiction. 
And the last thing she said that stuck in my mind was I don't remember anything else was whatever it is you're taking, if you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, you don't need it. So, man, I jumped up and I ran and I got that bottle of Valium and I started heading to the bathroom. And my wife was over there sitting on the couch looking at me like, what are you doing now? You know? Yeah, yeah. And I walked into the bathroom and I poured all those pills in my hand. And, I, and I'm like this, man. You know, I'm, I'm like this. And uh, I poured them all in my hand and I'm going to flush them. And then this voice tells me, are you sure you want to flush all those? Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, come on. So I started to put three back in, the, three or four back in the bottle. And then the Holy Spirit was like, dude, all or not. And I flushed them all. And by the time Come I on. walked out of that bathroom to the front room, I could have been a brain surgeon. Amen. I mean, my hands were completely calm, you know. And the bottom line was what I wanted more than anything at that time, because I had been used and abused, I wanted peace. Mm -hmm. I had no peace. My grandmother wasn't perfect. They struggled, but there was peace in her home. Yeah. You know, there was no peace in my life, no peace in my home, and that's what I wanted. And, uh, you know, it's been kind of up and down since then, you know. Uh, I got away from the Lord. I got back. I ain't getting away ever again. Yeah, You know Come what on. I mean? Yeah. Ever again. And, uh, but that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Amen. You know, <laughs> Jesus Christ is the only way. But you know what? Uh, he loves us, and I never could understand that kind of love <clears throat> that, you know, I know the love I have for my children, and uh, my children aren't walking with the Lord like they should be right now. But that does not deter my love for them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And God's love for each and every one of us is like that love. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts, yeah. you know? And that's what so many times the church has really fallen short, is by making it do's and don'ts, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, God sense. just loves us, you know? Yeah. Uh, the Bible tells us that he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness. He took my sins and gave me his, you know what I mean? And yeah. I didn't deserve that. Yeah, that's right. You know, I needed to be that lifer locked up, you know? Yeah. But uh, God's been so good to me, you know. Yeah, amen. He amen. brought, you know, brought me into this organization with CMA, and now I just want to share wherever I can with whoever will listen. Even if they won't listen, they're going to hear it. You That's know? right. That's right. Amen. Yeah, yeah kind of like, uh, kind of like I was saying about you know Ron playing the music, you know, and me just, you know, just being out there just for entertainment, you know. I went up there because oh look, there's a guitar in juvenile hall. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I want to go check that out. This is like an opportunity to, mm -hmm. uh, for better entertainment. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we're limited entertainment, you know, when we're behind bars. And, you know, it's, i got to take advantage of this. But then yet, you know, um, I, I know till this day, you know, that music has hit me. And it's w one of the reasons w what led me to Christ. And, yeah. Praise yeah. God. Well, you know, the motorcycles are, are a tool, too, Yeah, that yeah, we use, absolutely. especially when we do go into prisons and things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they tell us, hey, you know, <clears throat> this particular time, we're going to let you ride around the yard and rev them pipes. Yeah, let man. them know you're here, yeah. you know, and, and uh, sometimes we'll be on a yard where they can, the, the inmates can actually come up and, you know, talk to you about your bike and stuff and... Uh, and you know, it just it's just a doorway, you know, sure to, is, yeah. uh, to be able to share the gospel, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's always about relationship, you know, and how do we break the ice with people? Because even though we do have a premeditated journey, <laughs> sure, that we yeah. want to get people to Christ, but building a friend, you know, will open up those those opportunities to do that. You know, it's amazing how. You know, when you're talking about this, I'm thinking about this very thing. When, when, when God called me to come to the juvenile hall and the boot camp in Madeira, my main focus at that time was 
not necessarily all that I was saying, but I just knew that if the presence of God would touch them, they would be changed. Amen. So I came Amen. to promote the love of Jesus Christ through music and song and through the preaching of the word. Mm -hmm. But it was those things that I knew because that's what that's what impacted my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I wouldn't have been able to make it where you were raised up in that in that idea of of a denomination or whatever, however we want to term you know term this. But uh, it would have been tough for me because um, I I didn't do well under authority like that. But I, I you know if you told me not to do something I go do it just to see why you tell me not to do it. You right. know, then, yeah. And. Um, and, and but I understood that the closer that I got to Jesus, the more it began to change. Mm -hmm. You know, an exterior relationship, well, you'll have to change on your own. Right. <laughs> but when you have an interior right. relationship with Jesus Christ and it becomes intimate, you automatically begin to change because He's so good. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's why it's so important to get into your Word and to study uh, the Bible. It wasn't, you know, about 2010, I, I had to have a stent put in, you know, one of my arteries. And uh, it made me kind of think a little bit, you know, I, I, this time I had off, I had like, I had like 10 days or something like that, I was, you know, before I could go back to work. And I was looking at the Bible, because I used to pick up the Bible on Sunday, go to church, and then Sunday afternoon, I'd put it back in its little spot, you know, it pretty much stayed there till the next Sunday, you know. And I thought, you know what? Look, God, I want to get close to you. You know? And I knew that reading that Bible was one way. And now I can't hardly, I can't go a day without getting into that word. And as we do, it t the Bible talks about the washing, the renewing of the mind. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, I mean, we can ask Jesus Christ to come into our life. But if, if, if we don't dig into that word, and find out, you know, basically that sanctification of the Holy Spirit on a day by day. Uh, not that we're perfect, no, by far, but only through Christ are we perfect and, and God sees us perfect through Him. But it's that, you know, every day, every day, because it's a lot of times it's even like uh, subconsciously, you know, we're just out there at work or something and somebody does something and, and oh, man, there goes your. Yeah. There goes the temper, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, not that it doesn't go, but it's like, hey, God says, you know, I mean, we're out there with some hardcore guys sometimes, sure. you know? And uh, sometime, Roger uh, mentioned one time when I first joined, you know, hey, they call us the Boy Scouts. <laughs> you know, we're the Christians, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. We're the Boy Scouts. But you know what? What's harder? To love somebody that doesn't love you, to do good to those who are persecuting you, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't have to be in in in, in the biker community. Yeah. It could be your next door neighbor. Sure, Jesus did it all, all the time through all his ministry here on earth. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the um, the Romans despised the Jews, and the Jews uh, when they heard you know the Messiah was here, mm -hmm. they wanted retaliation sure. by force. But Jesus says, no, this isn't the way. You need to love on your enemy. Yes. And that's the true way to defeat the enemies, to love on them. Yeah, I've seen that happen. In it. You know, that's where God's working in my life right now. You know, just getting that, that love, uh, real, to, to be genuine, uh, self, uh, you know, not, not seeking self-interest. Mm -hmm. You know, we read about that, we hear about that. And it's easy to talk about it, but then once all of a sudden it's in your neck of the woods, you know, that's when like, hmm, yeah, I got to get that, yeah. you know. That's I don't know right. how many times I've said, when am I going to get this thing right? Yeah. You know, but uh, that's that sanctification where the Holy Spirit, it's a, it's a big term for the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit just working and just making us more like Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's the goal of each Christian is to be more like Christ, whether we're going to the prisons or or wherever at our job or what yes. have you you yes. know that's right and he was talking about uh, how the romans and the christians didn't get along oftentimes the enemy will put walls between us as people mm -hmm. uh, magnify our differences and a lot of times that will keep us out of 
church. Mm -hmm. I know when I was growing up as a young man, I you know I joined the Marine Corps at a young age and came back to my house tattooed, and my mother looked at me like I was green and had horns. <laughs> and I remember uh, my dad going to church on Sunday morning in his suit. I remember the other man in their suit, and I remember looking at them and looking at myself in the mirror and saying, you know what, I'm not them. I'm not in the same league of them. I'm not their kind of people. Certainly God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And then later when I got saved, I thought to myself, you know, there's got to be other people out there that feel exactly like that. Oh, yeah. You know, they feel like, hey, you know what? I'm too dirty. I've got too much history. I've done too many things. I'm too ugly. I'm too tainted by my past and my sins. Yeah. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I haven't got a chance. So why not just go out and continue to blow it? Yeah. And a lot of times we need to see somebody that looks like us, mm -hmm. that Jesus has redeemed. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that picture tells us, Come you know on. what? God brought him, he might just bring me too. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know? Yeah. Come on with that. You know, the, that you mentioned that, I'm thinking about the youth. And, and of course, once they were getting ready to leave the boot camp program or, or juvenile hall, either one, if they were willing to get connected to a church, um, Many times, you know, we would suggest churches for them to go to. If they wanted us to take them, we would, of course. We were hoping, you know, but mm -hmm. when they would go on their own, um, a lot of them were, you know, involved in gangs or want to be gang members and those types of things. And so they said when they went to church, they said they just didn't feel comfortable. They Music didn't stopped. feel like they fit in. They used, they used to say, I don't have any church clothes. I don't go to church because I don't have any church clothes. I said, I don't care what clothes you have. Just go. And they said, yeah, but they stare at us, you know, and I... And I thought, yeah, man, I mean, it's just part of the flesh to do that, you know. But but everybody wants to fit in somewhere. And and, and we're all trying to, when we, when we allow our lives to fit in somewhere in the world, it's very difficult to find a place to fit in the body sometimes. it's uh, Many times it's just our own mind that, mm -hmm. that keeps us from doing that because, you know, not... I don't want to say this and make it sound like you know like I'm special or something but for some reason when 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 the Lord called me into into his plan for my life when I really knew it was time for me to get into action and be a soldier I just believed that it didn't matter where I went I understood the body of Christ as being a whole body yes it wasn't about color it wasn't about culture it wasn't about political views it was about being the body of Christ so I felt like I was supposed to be welcomed everywhere I went mm -hmm. I had a message I had something to say and I was gonna say it every opportunity that I had to and I even made opportunities I wanted to tell it so bad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so so the, the the what we what we need for all of us is, is to understand that when Christ said that he calls us his bride that we're his body that means each and every one of us no matter where we go no matter where Amen. we came That's from true. but we're all going the same way Amen. see and because we're all going the same way we're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ no matter what the other fleshly or earthly circumstances are that are considered and and uh, fitting in is just a matter of you believing you fit in and if you feel like you're rejected wherever you go, fit in anyway. If God wants you there, it doesn't matter whether you feel accepted or not. But if that's where he wants you in life, that's where you need to be. Amen. And maybe he's going to take this situation that looks ugly. Maybe he's going to take this situation that's hurtful. And, and you, you're, you're just receiving rejection after rejection. But maybe he's using that rejection to change them. Mm -hmm. As well as strengthen well, us fact, yeah. yes. you know mm -hmm. as well as strengthen us mm -hmm. so you know it's like you should have the power like jesus to walk into a crowd everybody wanting to kill you and hate you but you're going to walk out of it and somebody's going to get saved you know what mm -hmm. i mean it says god's going to bring you out he's going to protect you and and but lives are going to be changed or seed is going to be sown or the message is going to go out no matter where it is what it is and I'll be the last one to tell you to jeopardize your job or jeopardize your position or jeopardize. That's between you and God. God's telling you to step up to the plate in your position, your situation in life. And it could cost you your job or it could cost you your business or it could cost you your future. If he's calling you to do it, no matter what you lose, you've got to get back so much more. That's right. Man. That's right.
But if you do it on your own, yeah, you're subject to it being your downfall, of course. Mm -hmm. It still doesn't mean God won't be there to pick you up. It still doesn't mean God isn't going to work in our situation. It just means we got ahead of him or we were behind him. Right. Right. So walking step by step daily with Jesus is right where we need to be, the perfect center of his will. Right. And no matter what happens on the exterior, the interior is always good. Right. There's always peace. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. matter what's going on out here. Yeah. And, yes. and if, if you're at all confused by any any of this that w what we discussed here today just go ahead and call the number on screen right now and um and uh hopefully i remember to put it on that hd video but <laughs> um but uh, just be sure to you know be as thorough with your question as possible so that we may be able to answer it, um as much as you can if you want to have contact too you can still contact the number i'll relay the message to to rick or roger and um, uh, about the CMA, if you have any questions, and if you want to be involved too, uh, and um, I believe there's no um, there's no uh, recommendation or no um, uh, um, uh, what what's the word I'm looking for um, to, to become a member? Or? Yes, any uh, any recommendate like uh, any type of bike that you're supposed to have anything no. specific. No, you don't even have to have a motorcycle. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You don't even have to have a motorcycle to become a member of yeah. CMA. We, we, we are not a motorcycle club. We don't, you know, pay dues or, mm -hmm. or prospect, right. you know, members or stuff like that. So, uh, but, you know, we just, you know, and if you're not born again, you can get born again, oh. you know. Uh, but as far as a, a certain size of motorcycle or make or model, no, none of that's required, no. you know. Before we... we offer membership we just ask that you believe Jesus is Lord you know that he came he died for our sins mm -hmm. you know, on the cross and then on the third day he come up out of there alive hey. amen yeah. you know? we're yeah. coming up alive it's too yeah. Yeah. Right <laughs> yes. amen. Yeah. Yeah. amen Ron amen. you got a song for us well you know I don't but I do want to say this we're not done, Mom. Jesus is calling that song is running through my, my mind right now Jesus is calling, and and I think today if we're we're winding this down. Um, all the testimony that we've heard and the, and the issues that we've talked about. The number one point of everything that we do is to build the kingdom of God. Right. Mm -hmm. And yes, fire starters is, is, is we feel that fire starters is a as a ministry that is running towards revival. We want to pass the baton. It used to be called the baton yeah. pass. Mm -hmm. We want to pass the baton to people in the yeah. airways because mm -hmm. nobody, nobody. I, I like I said that doesn't matter what what your past is. Doesn't matter if you educated or you're not educated doesn't matter if you're talented or not talented doesn't matter if you even think god likes you what we're here to tell you today is, is jesus is calling there's no one no one that has ever lived on this earth or ever will live on this earth that is not important to god yes. and important to jesus christ he is calling because he wants to reach you he wants to have mm -hmm. intimacy with you he wants you to know him at least somewhat to what he knows yes. you there's not nobody that Jesus does not know. If you're out of your mind, I'm telling you to come to your mind in Christ Jesus right now. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is I, whatever your predicament, your situation, no matter what you're thinking right now, it, all that has to go away when Jesus Christ enters right. into the equation uh -huh. because when it's new life, he's talking about new life and we begin to think new. Mm -hmm. we, you know, yes, we get haunted by the past, but you don't have to live in your past. Jesus is calling in 2017, the Spirit of God is beginning to move, and it's going to move like we have never seen before as long as we've been alive on this earth. Yeah. Wow. All the past revivals have been phenomenal and fantastic, and hundreds of thousands of lives have been changed. Mm -hmm. But there are so many people on the earth now, this next move that God is, is starting to prepare us for, this next move is going to save the millions. Did you hear me? The millions. Yes. So we're preparing. Fire starters is a ministry running towards revival because we want you to be mm -hmm. prepared. If you already know Jesus Christ and you've got one foot in the world and you've got one right. foot in the church, mm -hmm. I'm telling you to pull that other foot out of the world right now. Thank you. I'm so, telling you right now, pull it out and yes. get in. Yes. And I'm not just talking about going to a church building. Oh. I'm talking <laughs> about you being the church in here. Jesus Christ wants to invade your life, not just 
heal it and straighten it out for you. He wants you to be a living so and good. vibrant by the power of Holy Spirit in your life to where you're going to be effective to do what He's calling you to do in the earth. We are agents in the earth and He's calling you to be an ambassador wherever you're going, He has sent you. Mm -hmm. And so it's no time to play anymore. It's time to get prepared. It's time to get on the move. It's time to be real with Jesus Christ so that He, he can be real in and through yeah. us. Yeah. Let's come on. Let's yeah. let's get let's go, church. Amen. Let's go. Yes, yes. You no, know, we're not no longer supposed to Thank be you. the world. Mm. We are supposed to be the church yes. of the Lord Jesus Christ, inside the building and out. Yes, in your living room right now, wherever you're at, in your bathroom, come in on. your kitchen, at your come workplace. On. If you're out in the middle of the desert, but you got a smartphone, whatever it is. God is calling you to be all you can be in Christ Jesus in these yes. times and in these days. Because uh -huh. He's coming, and right. He's coming soon. Uh -huh. He's coming back. Yes. And when He comes back, praise God, we are going to be so victorious, we don't even have an idea the power and the love and the mercy and the grace yeah. of Jesus Christ that is going to hit this earth. Yes. Amen. Praise oh, God. Amen. So join us today and get into agreement in prayer as we are running towards revival, spreading the fire of God, reaching the people out uh, throughout the internet and the world with this message and just pray with us and just get in agreement as w whatever, whatever prayer you need, you pray for it and receive it in the name of Jesus. Mm. Father God, I thank yeah, you for today. Thank I you, thank Lord. you for this fellowship. Yes, I thank, thank you for, for this Roger. time that you have thank put you. before us and ahead of us and and behind us for past experiences as you taught us uh, uh, to be the people who we are now. Yes. Father, we just thank you that this message encourages others out there and to, so they may spread the fire. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for every opportunity, Lord, that you give to us to be your witnesses, to testify of your changing love and power and your mercy and your grace. I, I just thank you for Roger and I just thank you for Rick, Lord. And I ask that you would double portion and anointing mm. upon their lives, Father, to do what they're doing through the ministry of CMA, mm. CMA Lord God. Mm. And that it would continue to reach more and more and more of the lost and the dying and the hurting that are so desperately in need of Jesus Christ and may not even know it yet. For the enemy has blinded this world. He continues to try to blind. He continues to try to deafen. Mm -hmm. He tries to stop your voice, Father, from resounding in the earth. But you have called us all as agents, Father, to, to send out the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ into the earth. We answer the call. Like Uncle Sam says, looking for a few good men. God, I know you're looking for a few good men that will follow Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so as we all dedicate our lives to you, we are ready, Father, to be sent into motion to do all that you have for us to accomplish in this earth as we build your kingdom, Lord Jesus. We just thank you. We worship. We praise you, Lord, that we get to do this, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Father. Thank you. Yes, come on. Yeah. People get ready. Yes. There's a train a coming. Yes. You don't need no baggage. You just get on board. Amen. <laughs> no ticket, no baggage. Just That's come on. Right.